Hello. In this video, I would like to discuss a paper that Timoshenko published in 1925. Now, Timoshenko was uh, a Russian-American engineer that introduced several developments in the elasticity of bodies. You perhaps know the Timoshenko beam theory that is an improvement of the classic Euler-Bernoulli beam theory that accounts for the shear deformation. Now, in this paper of 1925, he studied uh, bimetallic strips. A common application for this kind of devices are the thermostats. So thermostats, in this case, are made of two different layers of different metals coupled together and subjected to a thermal load. This causes a rising in temperature and therefore a deformation. Now, since the two metals have different coefficient of thermal expansion, this will cause a bending. And we would like to investigate this bending knowing the delta T. This is the scheme of the system. We have the strip here that has a rectangular cross section and a height H, and it's composed by two layers, layer one and layer 2. Each layer has respectively a height A1 and A2. Now there is a straightforward relationship between the heights. It basically says that H is equal to A1 plus A2. Please note that no constraints are placed on the values that A1 and A2 should have. They could be equal or different, no problem at all. The last point that it's worthy to highlight is that this is a plain problem. What happens along this direction is not really of interest for us. It can be demonstrated that the curvature of the bimetallic strip does not depend on its width. This is because the widths of the two layers are equal and they will simplify during the calculations. Therefore, we will set it equal to 1. And that's it. Timoshenko made three preliminary hypotheses. The first one states that the coefficients of linear thermal expansion do not depend on temperature. This, from a mathematical point of view, means that alpha is constant, whatever the value of the temperature. Now, alpha is a Greek letter and is commonly used to identify this physical quantity, the linear thermal expansion. This alpha coefficient is generally measured in Kelvin to the power of minus 1. And for a steel, I can give you this as an example. Its value is 1.2 times 10 to the power of minus 5 Kelvin to the power of minus 1. The second hypothesis is that all the possible friction losses are negligible. This means no hysteresis, no friction on the supports, no internal dissipation. The last hypothesis simply says the beam theory is valid. So since the width is small, you are working with something that is similar to a beam rather than a plate. In this slide, I gather all the main hypotheses that are behind the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory. You can pause the video if you want to take a closer look. What I would like to do instead is to comment these two formulas. Now, the first one, actually, it is the most elementary brick on which you build your knowledge of elasticity, so it doesn't really require any particular command. The second one instead is called Navier's formula because it was proposed by this guy that was a French engineer, the same of the Navier-Stokes equations, in the 18th century. And it basically describes the distribution of stresses on a slender beam when a bending moment is acting. So this is the bending moment M. The beam has a cross section. This cross section has a moment of inertia that is I, capital I. And you should know that the distribution of stresses is a butterfly distribution. In this case, here we have traction. Here we have compression. And this is the axis Y, zero h over 2 here. Another important point is the curvature, kappa. This is the Greek letter kappa. The curvature is the inverse 
of the radius of curvature that is measured in meters, so it's a length. And you can easily obtain this expression by merging these two equations. So I will do that. So you can write that sigma, that is Young modulus times strain, is equal to the Navier's expression. So M, bending moment, over capital I, modulus of inertia of the section, times Y. Kappa is defined as epsilon over Y, and therefore is bending moment over capital E times capital I. And this is what you get here. Now, the Timoshenko work has been to find a mathematical relationship between kappa, so the curvature, and a delta temperature. He wanted to know how kappa varies if delta t varies, knowing, of course, all the physical, mechanical, and geometrical parameters. So, let's dive into the actual work made by Timoshenko. Here, you have the strip, and in this case, we suppose that the two layers are not bonded together. So, this surface does not transmit any load from one layer to the other. Imagine to have a temperature T0, and then to have a change in temperature so that it becomes T. Now, you can easily compute a delta temperature, that is T minus T0. This delta temperature can be greater than zero or smaller than zero, depending on the fact you are heating or cooling your system. Now, in this system, I made two hypotheses that do not prevent the generality of the work. The first hypothesis is to have a delta T greater than zero. The second hypothesis instead is to have alpha 2 greater than alpha 1. So, once temperature increases, you will record an increase of length of both the metals. This increase of length can be computed as these formulas suggest. So, the original length times the coefficient of linear thermal expansion times delta t. Now, since I made the hypothesis that alpha 2 is bigger than alpha 1, delta L2 will be bigger than delta L1. To solve the problem, we must write equilibrium and compatibility equations. Now, equilibrium means equilibrium of forces. Instead, compatibility means to restore original geometrical configuration. So, to pass from this simple case in which we have a step here to the true deformed configuration. So, the point is this one. In the actual system, all the forces are exchanged over this surface that will be called bearing surface. So, we will have in this particular case that the orange metal put in traction the blue one because it will pull the blue layer and it will ask to it to elongate more. Instead, the blue layer will push back the orange layer. So, this will result in a true deformed configuration that will have this shape. This is the separation, so it's the bearing surface. Now, what can we say about this system of forces? We can create an equivalent system of forces simply moving these two forces away and placing them on the centroid of the two sections. So we can move the purple arrow here, but if we move it, we should add a bending moment. Now, pink arrow, we will have to add another bending moment. Okay, we are now arrived to the crucial part. The system on which we are working is this one. This is the strip, you know that here you have the bearing surface, this is the material 1, and this is the material 2. Recall that the total height of the strip is H, the two heights of the layers are A1 and A2. Recall that. On the surface, as we already discussed, are acting a force P1, another force P2, and two lumped moments, so M2 and M2. M1. Now, since no external forces are acting on the strip, we know that the sum of the forces on the entire cross-section must be zero. So, the first equation we can write is that P1 minus P2 is equal to zero. Therefore, P1 is equal to P2, that is equal to P. And this is the first result here. The second result will come if we write the equilibrium of moments. And if you look at this picture, this one, you can easily write that P1 that we know is equal to P, times A1 over 2, plus P2, that is equal to P, times A2 over 2, is equal to M1 plus M2. So, you can modify a little bit the left side, collecting P over 2, and therefore writing A1 plus A2, 
that is equal to h. So you get p times h over 2. On the right side of the equation, we have to make an hypothesis, that is a fundamental hypothesis in uh, the beam theory. That is, the curvature, kappa, is equal for both the layers. So layer 1 and layer 2 will have the same curvature. This is because a cross-section that is perpendicular to the neutral axis will remain perpendicular to it even after the deformation. And this means that a cross-section must remain planar. So we cannot permit that the two layers have a different value of curvature. If you remember, the curvature was defined as 1 over rho that is equal to m over flexural rigidity. But since kappa 1 is equal to kappa 2, what we can write is that m1 plus m2 is equal to 1 over rho times capital I1 capital E1 plus capital I2 capital E2. And this is the second result here. As regards the compatibility equation, that is this one, we have to focus on the bearing surface as written here. So, what we should write is that, just recall for a second the simple system. The true strain on this point should be equal for both the metals. So, the strain 1 in this point must be equal to the strain 2 where 1 is this material and 2 is this one. So how can we write it? Let's take just the material 1, for example. We know that on the material 1 is acting a force P and a moment, M. We want to write the, the strain of this point, and we will put it equal to the strain of the, this point of the material 2. Let's focus for now on layer 1. We have a strain that is given by the temperature, so alpha 1 times delta t, and so this is the thermal strain, epsilon thermal. Then we have an epsilon due to the force p. Let's change some colors to make it clearer, so we can use orange, so this is p. So the strain of the force p is equal to sigma over e, that is p over area times 1 over e. Now, since the width of the strip was set equal to 1, we have that the area is 1 times A1. So the strain will be P over E1 times A1. Then we have, let's use blue, a strain given by the moment. So the strain of the moment will have this strain. And we are now focused on this value, epsilon m. Epsilon m is, as before, sigma over E. That is, let's use the Navier's equation, m over capital I times y times 1 over e. But then, if you recall, this was the curvature. So we have kappa times y. In this case, y equal to a1 over 2. And therefore, here we have kappa times a1 over 2. And this is the total strain of this purple point on material 1. And it's what is written here. The same reasoning can be done for the layer number 2. Please note that here you have a minus and also E, and here you have a plus. This is simply because on material 1 you have a force that is going to a right and a bending moment that is elongating this point in material 1. Instead of material 2 you have a compressive force, so you will tend to push back the point and you will have a bending moment that also will try to push it back. And so they are negative as it's written here. Thermal expansion, if delta t is greater than zero, it's always positive. Let's see how to obtain this result, that is what we were aiming for since the beginning, from the equation we had written a few moments ago.
and what we obtain is exactly what it's written here. This is the equation that links the curvature with the temperature, knowing, of course, all the parameters. So alpha 2, alpha 1, E1, E2, A1, and A2. Then, of course, once you know A1 and A2, you can compute H, and you can compute I. Recall, as it's written here, that we set the thickness of the strip equal to 1, so the moment of inertia are simply 112 A cube. For this video is enough. See you on the next one. In the following video, we will speak about the stress distribution inside the bimetallic strip, but more importantly, we will see how to compute the vertical displacement of a strip knowing its curvature. So imagine, for example, to have a simply supported bimetallic strip, like this one, and now to apply a delta temperature. The strip may deform in this way. So you might be interested in knowing this vertical displacement delta, and we will see how to compute delta knowing the curvature. Knowing the curvatures eventually means knowing the radius of curvature.